Right, so today we're going to read from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 1. I'm going to start reading at verse 18. So Matthew's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 18. It's going to be very familiar reading to many of us. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Let's just pray quickly, and then we'll think about those words. So, Father God, we thank you for the very familiar story to us. But Lord, we thank you that your word is living and active. And we pray you would speak to each one of us this morning through these words that we've read from the Bible as we consider their meaning for us. Lord, make them alive in our hearts and our minds, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, we are in school nativity season. And many of you have already been to a school nativity, no doubt, already. And I've never envied the teachers who have to try and find a part for every child. Uh, I can remember going to Nativity one year to watch one of my children, uh, and they were playing the part of the third camel. <laughs> and clearly, if you are the third camel, you are not the star of the show. In fact, uh, I did some very informal research on Mumsnet, uh, and there's one role that is considered the top role, the one to get. I expect you can all guess what it is. It's not the third camel, it is to be Mary. Uh, Apparently, if you're Mary in a nativity, you've got the leading role. And then, interestingly, there was a bit of discussion about what was the second best role. Uh, And it turned out to be a toss-up between the angel Gabriel or the narrator. (laughs) Poor old Joseph didn't even make it into the top three. Uh, And there were even some people who who would put him lower down, saying it was better to be a king or a shepherd than to play the part of Joseph. You know, Joseph is someone we do tend to overlook. And we don't spend that much time thinking about him. Which is why I'm thankful that when Matthew writes his accounts of that first Christmas, he does a lot to show us Joseph's perspective on what was going on. Uh, And what we actually see in Joseph is he's someone who who role models a faithful example of discipleship. He demonstrates to us what faithful discipleship looks like. Uh, And as we we look at these verses, what we see is that in Joseph, he demonstrates forgiveness and compassion, faith in God's word, and costly obedience. We see these things in Joseph's life. Uh, And so, first of all, Joseph demonstrates forgiveness and compassion. Now, I'm not really much of a Shakespeare fan, but even I know that in his play, Julius Caesar, one of the most famous lines is when he says, et tu brute, 
which means, and you, Brutus. And those words are spoken during the assassination scene when all the conspirators get together and they're about to stab Caesar. And he sees that Brutus, who is his friend, is amongst the conspirators. And when he says, et tu, Brutus, it's an expression of betrayal. And the fact that the deepest wound was the betrayal of a friend. Now, many of us will know what it's like to be let down and hurt by people, but we also know that when that person who hurts us or lets us down is someone that we trusted, someone that we thought was on our side, then that wound can be much deeper and much harder to forgive. I know a couple where one of them had an affair, and their marriage almost ended, and they decided that they really wanted to make it work. Uh, And so whenever they came together to try and talk things through and make it work, what they found is that one of them was filled with lots of pain and hurt, the other one was filled with lots of guilt, and when that pain and that guilt came together, it would go whoosh, and it would turn into a blazing row. Despite their best intentions, when someone close to us hurts us, it can be really hard to move on from that. And when we read this account of the Christmas story, we see that Joseph is in the position of someone who has been hurt by someone close to him, someone he trusted. We're told in verse 18 that he was pledged to be married to Mary. Being pledged, it was a bit more than just being engaged. When you were pledged to be married, it means that there'd been uh, a ceremony in front of your family where the two families got together, where both people committed that they'd be married to each other, and a prenuptial agreement was made, and effectively you had a contract of marriage. But then there'd be a year where the couple wouldn't live together, they wouldn't have a sexual relationship, which is why in verse 18 it says this was before they came together. So they weren't fully married, but everyone in the community would regard you as married. So that's why it tells us that it calls them a husband and a wife, and it talks about Joseph wanting to divorce Mary. So in their their, uh, culture... They were committed to marriage. They were regarded as a husband and wife, even though they weren't fully married. So when Joseph discovers that Mary's pregnant, for him, that was the ultimate betrayal. This is the woman who just committed to marry him, who he had been given lots of assurances, was a woman of good character and integrity, and now as far as he's concerned, she's just committed adultery and she is pregnant. It would have been a really deep wound and a shock to him. Uh, And we see his response because in verse 19, we're told what Joseph does in response to this. He says, Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Where it says he was faithful to the law, it means that he was someone who always tried to obey God's laws written in the Old Testament. And in the book of Deuteronomy in the Old Testament, there's a law for this situation. And it says that if you're pledged to be married to someone and then you discover that they've cheated on you, the right thing to do is to not go through with that marriage and to divorce this person. So Joseph, wanting to be faithful to the law, wanting to honour God, would have had no choice. He would have had to divorce Mary, because if he didn't, then he would have dishonoured God by ignoring his law. And in a divorce, in these circumstances, it would normally involve a public trial where Joseph would stand up and he would accuse Mary of adultery. And by accusing her of adultery, he would make it clear to everyone that this baby was nothing to do with him, and that would restore his honour and reputation in the community, but it would completely trash Mary's reputation. She'd be humiliated, she would be facing an uncertain future with no financial security because no other man would want to marry her. 
And if Joseph went down that route, you could understand it because he'd been betrayed, he'd been hurt, he'd be within his rights, and yet he chooses to take a different route. Instead, he decides he will quietly divorce her. It's a decision to say that, actually, I've been really hurt, but I'm not going to respond by hurting this person back. I'm not going to try and get revenge. I'm not going to do a tit-for-tat thing. Instead, I'm going to treat Mary better than I believe she deserves to be treated. I'm going to try and spare her as much pain and disgrace and embarrassment as possible, and I'm just going to do this thing quietly. That was an incredible act of compassion and forgiveness on Joseph's part. It goes against our natural instincts when we're hurt. And it's also a faithful example of what discipleship and following Jesus looks like. Because Jesus told us we should love our enemies. Jesus said we should bless those who curse us. Jesus said that we should forgive those who hurt us in the same way that God has forgiven us. And this is what we see Joseph doing. How do we treat people who hurt us? How do we respond to those who wound us deeply? So Joseph demonstrates compassion and forgiveness in his response to Mary. He also demonstrates faith in God's word. Faith in God's word. You know, as many of you know that sometimes in life, God leaves us in a place where we struggle and doesn't always step in to help us straight away. I know of someone who found themselves in debt. They had a a family to support, uh, and over time the debt grew until it reached a point where they would get sort of halfway through the month, and they'd run out of money. And they didn't know, well, how am I going to buy food? How am I going to put pets in the car? How will I give my children the bus fare to get to school? Uh, And they they were a Christian, so they would pray. And and they said, Lord, in the Bible it says, you own the cattle on a thousand hills. You have unlimited resources. Please, can you help us? Please, can you get us out of this debt? I don't want to be rich. I just want to be able to provide for my family. Uh, And they were praying this, and and God did help them. You know, things would happen like uh, they one month, it got halfway through the month, they had no money for food, and randomly a friend knocked on the door with food and and said, I was just in the supermarket and I just thought I'd buy some stuff for some meals. And they gave him food for free meals. On another occasion, someone gave him some money and it was just enough money to cover the petrol to the end of the month. So God did help, but this situation went on for a couple of months. A couple of months of living under the constant nagging pressure of debt. Uh, And this person reached the point where they felt, if this carries on, I think I might have some kind of breakdown. I don't think I can carry on living like this. And they even had a picture, and they described it as being up to their neck in flood water. And if they stood on their tiptoes, they could just keep their head above the water and breathe. That's how they felt their life was like. Uh, and, And they felt that you know, God, he's helping us, but he's, he's just doing enough to keep our heads above water, but he's not rescuing us from this flood. Why isn't God doing more to help us? And then one morning, they were reading Psalm 22. And in Psalm 22, it's written by a man called David, and in one point he says, God, why have you forsaken me? And as they were reading a little devotion about this passage, Devotion talked about how David felt like God had forsaken him, but actually God was there. And those same words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, were spoken by Jesus on the cross. And on the cross, Jesus was forsaken by God so that we might never need to experience that ourselves. And as he was reading this and thinking about this verse, he realised, you know, God is with us. God is helping us. And it relieved that tension. It relieved his stress. It took away that feeling that he was about to have a breakdown as he trusted in the reassurance he got from God's word. And shortly afterwards, 
they came in some unexpected money that cleared their debt, and God rescued them out of that flood water of debt. You see, sometimes God allows us to go through difficult situations. And that's what happens with Joseph. In verse 20, it says, after he'd considered this. After he considered this. That means after he'd gone through the shock of discovering Mary was pregnant. After he'd wrestled with all his feelings and and wrestled with forgiveness. After he'd gone through sleepless nights trying to work out what am I going to do? What is the right thing to do? After he made a decision, that was the point God stepped in and spoke to him. God allowed Joseph to go through a period of testing that would have refined his character and would have grown his faith before God stepped in and spoke into his situation. And we read that in a dream, God says to him through an angel, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he'll save his people from their sins. See, when God speaks to him, he tells him two really important things. First of all, he tells him this pregnancy is is the work of the Holy Spirit. This is something God has done. Mary has not been unfaithful to him. And because Mary has not been unfaithful to him, he is not obligated to divorce her. And then he's told that this child isn't any ordinary baby. He's to call this child Jesus. He's been conceived by the Holy Spirit. And then there's an explanation about why he's called Jesus. It's because he'll save his people from their sins. Now there's something here that we'll miss, but Joseph wouldn't have missed. Because Jesus is the Greek version of a Hebrew name, Yehoshua, which means God saves. But in the description and explanation, we're told that he's given this name because Jesus, this baby, is going to save. So for a Jewish person, he's being told that this baby is more than just an ordinary person because this baby is going to do things that only God can do. This baby is God come amongst us. And for those of us who might be slower on the uptake, in the next verse, Matthew puts a bit of commentary, quotes from an Old Testament prophecy about how this child will be Emmanuel. He says it means God with us. And so... God speaks into Joseph's situation and he believes God. He believes God's word. And that would have relieved that tension. It would have relieved that stress, that emotional turmoil that he was going through. He found release through trusting in God's word. Just like the person who was in debt found release from that feeling they're on the edge of a breakdown when they trusted in God's word and allowed the Holy Spirit to bring comfort and strength to them through Psalm 22. Joseph found comfort and strength through believing God's word. And we can also, if we respond to God's word with faith, the Holy Spirit will comfort and strengthen us through the words of the Bible as well. Joseph demonstrates faithful discipleship when he placed faith in God's word. And lastly, he demonstrated costly obedience. We're told that when he woke up, he immediately obeyed the things God had said to him. So in verse 24, when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he didn't consummate the marriage until she gave birth to a son and he gave him the name Jesus. So Joseph completes the marriage, he takes Mary home to be his wife, and when the baby's born, Joseph names the baby, and because he named the baby, it means that he'd officially adopted Jesus as his son. He obeyed everything that God had told him to do. But, this obedience would have been costly for Joseph. In his culture, 
it would have been impossible in a small village to keep the pregnancy a secret. When a baby pops up five or six months after they're married, everyone knows something has gone on. Uh, And their assumption would have been that either Joseph and Mary had had sex before they were married and got pregnant, which would have mean that from that point on, Joseph would have been seen as a man of poor character and poor reputation. Or Mary had cheated on Joseph. Any of those scenarios in people's minds would have brought shame on them. It would have made them a scandalous couple. And if Joseph came along to someone in the village and said, no, it's not what you think, it was the Holy Spirit that produced this child in Mary's womb, they would have thought either Joseph is extremely gullible, that Mary's convinced him of this, or Joseph must think I'm extremely gullible. So for Joseph, he knew that by taking Mary to be his wife, For the rest of his life, people would judge him, they would look down on him, and treat him with disdain. It's highly likely that the respectable people in their area would not have wanted to be seen associating with this scandalous couple. Unlikely to have wanted to invite them into their home for a meal. See, there was a cost to obedience for Joseph. More than just believing God and adopting this child, his reputation and his honour were lost in the eyes of many people because he obeyed what God called him to do. And you know, around the world, there are lots of people who pay a high price for being Christians. Uh, we, we heard about it recently when Dave came back from India and he said that he'd met women who are Christians and they get beaten by their husbands for converting to Christianity. And they often turn up to church with black eyes and bleeding noses because their husbands have beaten them when they found out they wanted to go to church. You know, their obedience comes with a high cost. And in our country, we won't have to pay as high a cost as that for being a Christian. But there will be a cost to faithful obedience. If we want to be faithful to historic Christianity, then it's quite likely there will be many people who will judge us, who will look down on us. We may find we lose some friendships. We may find that our reputation takes a nosedive in many people's eyes. See, there is a cost to following Jesus. But the example we see in Joseph is someone who believed that obeying God was of greater worth than getting the affirmation of the people he lived around. Someone who believed that even though obedience might be costly, the blessings that come with obedience are worth it and make it worthwhile. That he would rather pay a cost socially for obeying God than miss out on the blessings of obedience would bring to him, because that would be the greater cost. Could you imagine? Could you imagine if Joseph had woken up and said, I'm not going to do that, it's too hard. And then he didn't take Mary as his wife. He would have missed out on being a part of Jesus' story on earth. That would have been tragic for him. More tragic than having some of his neighbours look down upon him. You see, obedience can be costly, but the blessings that God gives to those who obey him far outweigh the cost. And ultimately, those who choose not to obey are the ones who lose out. See, Joseph shows us an example of costly obedience. And so we see in in this example of faithful discipleship, we see that he demonstrates forgiveness and compassion. He demonstrates faith in God's word. And he demonstrates costly obedience. You know, Joseph is a role model for anyone who wants to follow Jesus. This is what it looks like. This is what it means to be a follower of him. So how do we compare to Joseph's example? Do we always respond with compassion and forgiveness to those who hurt us? Uh, Have we resisted the urge to respond in a tit-for-tat manner and hurt them in return? 
even if that hurt was done in a more passive way. We might not have said anything mean to them, but we withdraw emotionally from them, or we withhold our friendship as a way of punishing them. When people hurt us, do we return good to them? Do we trust in God's word? Do we have confidence in the promises of God? Or do we find ourselves succumbing to worry and fear and effectively doubt the goodness and faithfulness of God by doing that? Are we willing to obey God even if there is a cost to us, even if it involves sacrifice for us as individuals? You know, if I was to give an honest answer to these questions, I would have to say no. I try to do these things, and sometimes I do do them, but quite often I don't. I fail, I get it wrong. And I suspect I'm not the only one who cannot live up to this standard that we see in Joseph in this passage. And the wrong response to that would be to say, all right, I'm going to try harder to be more like Joseph. And the reason why trying harder to be more like Joseph is wrong is because it relies on us. And we know, and we see it every new year, we start off with good intentions of our resolutions, but over time it wears out and we fail. See, the answer is not for us to try harder to be like Joseph. The answer is for us to look to Jesus. To look to Jesus. In this passage, we're told he's called Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And what that means is when I become aware that I have failed, that I've not forgiven someone, that I've not blessed someone who's cursed me, when I become aware that I've doubted God or I I should have obeyed and and I didn't, in those moments when I could admit my failures, I can come to Jesus and I can ask for his forgiveness and he will forgive me. Because he came to save me from my sins. He'll forgive me for what I've done wrong and he'll take away my guilt and my shame. So I need to look to Jesus when I fail to be like Joseph. And we're also told in this passage that he was Emmanuel, God with us. And that means that Jesus is with me and it means I can turn to him and ask for his help and for his strength to be more like Joseph. When I'm struggling to forgive someone, I can ask Jesus to help me, to give me the grace I need, to give me the love for that person I need to forgive them. When I'm struggling with doubts, when I feel worry and anxiety and fear overwhelming me, I can turn to Jesus and I can say, help me. Give me the faith I need to trust in you. And when I'm struggling with a cost of obedience, I can turn to Jesus and I say, Please give me the courage, give me the boldness I need to follow you no matter what the cost may be. You know, in short, if you want to be able to be like Joseph, then you have to turn to Jesus. And you have to open your heart to him and fully surrender your heart to him. And he will take away your failure and he will give you the strength to live more faithfully each day. Let's pray, shall we? Father God, we thank you for Jesus. Father, we thank you that it's not about us. You've never asked us to try our best to impress you. You sent your son to deal with our failures and he came to be with us to help us to live a better life. Lord, help us, each one, to turn wholeheartedly to Jesus. Lord, we ask this in your name. Amen. Amen.